Welcome, bienvenue. My name is Séverine Martin. I'm the director of Columbia University's undergraduate program in Paris. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you today to the third conversation of Entre Nous, an interdisciplinary series featuring dialogues between scholars, journalists, and art artists from around the world. The series has been curated through the fruitful collaboration between the Columbia Global Centers Paris, the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, and the American Library in Paris. I have the additional honor of introducing today's speakers who, judging by the several hundreds of attendees, need no introduction. Yet I will do my due diligence and introduce the two Joyces. Joyce Maynard, you started publishing stories in magazines when you were just 13 years old. You are such an inspiration for so many generations of young writers. You first came to national attention with the publication in 1972 of your boldly entitled cover story for the New York Times, An 18-Year-Old Looks Back on Life. You were then just a freshman at Yale. You are today a regular contributor to NPR and newspapers across the United States, such as the New York Times Magazine and many more. Lastly, you have an impressive track record with 18 books translated in multiple languages. Your latest novel, Count the Ways, has just been translated in France by Edition Philippe Ray. Joyce Carol Oates, how can I even dare sum up your life's works? A legend, Joyce Maynard said earlier. You have been publishing since 1963 and your latest work, Night, Sleep, Death, The Stars, has also just been translated in French by Edition Philippe Ray. You have won numerous awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, the National Humanities Medal, and the Jerusalem Prize. It is a true honor and joy to have you with us today. Guiding us through this conversation of the two Joyces is my dear colleague, Sinead McCausland, our programming and communication coordinator. Sinead, the floor is all yours. Firstly, thank you so much, Joyce Maynard and Joyce Carolots for being here today and being part of this series. It's really an honor for us. And thank you for everyone watching at home. Um, so I guess we can begin. Um, and maybe uh, Joyce Maynard, do you want to take the first question? Um, but this is directed for both of you. So you've each been writing novels for well over four decades and now have had novels released during the middle of a pandemic. Could you give a general description of how the literary landscape has changed over the course of your writing careers? And maybe later we can go into more specific details because it's a big question to start with. <laughs> it is huge. I'm hoping that Joyce will, will cover this one um, uh, more fully than I can. I will just say that, um, you know, the literary landscape has changed and I have grown up, so I have to separate the two. Um, most, most, most present for me at the moment um, is, a, is a disturbing aspect, which is the, the kinds of limitations that have been placed on on writers that I'm very disturbed about that that limit our ability to expand our stories beyond those of our personal history and um, and experience. I um, a, a novel written by a woman, a white woman in another country, for instance, would now be viewed as appropriative, and I I I have had this experience personally. Um, at the same time, I, I'm excited by being able to reach a much bigger global audience with my work as I do today. Um, my, um, I'm going to turn the floor to Joyce because I think she, she has the, the, the greatest perspective on this question. Well, I'm sure that we have, um, we've had so many mutual experiences, I think, with being writers. But to look back in a sort of historical way, when I, when I was in high school and when I was in college, the idea of, of American literature was mostly, I mean, really entirely male, male-oriented. There were a few idiosyncratic and very brilliant 
women writers like Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor. There had been Edith Wharton and, you know, really just a few others. But generally, literature was, con was the province of white male, straight white male writers. So in my, in my lifetime, I've seen that just proliferate and sort of explode in a really wonderful way. So we have all sorts of diversity. We have every kind of ethnic American writer. We have gay literature, lesbian, everything, you know, whereas it was a very narrow white male, straight white male road or highway when I was in high school. Now it's become this sort of interstate network of all kinds of different perspectives, which is obviously very wonderful. I, I, I will just add to Joyce's observation that I've had the unusual experience of being a student twice um, at, at university with 48 years separating my two experiences. I, I, I went to Yale when I was 17, dropped out when I was 18, and returned when I was 65. Um, I had never, there were no classes in African American literature or, or so many other kinds of literature. I had never read Zora Neale Hurston until two years ago. Um, there, her books were out of print, I believe, an, an amazement. Um, if, if Yale had given me nothing else but, but their eyes were watching God, I'd say that was, that was worth the trip. Joyce, uh, Joyce Maynard, I think you touched on something quite interesting too with what you said about how you've grown in age as well as the literary landscape has changed. And so uh, this kind of goes hand in hand with your writing styles. And so I'm wondering with the changes in publishing in the industry, the dominance of the internet, it might be interesting for your readers tonight or today to understand the evolution of your writing style over the course of the past few years in conjunction with this changing landscape too. Um, you know, I, I had a very odd kind of childhood. Um, I, was, I was raised in a sort of a boot camp of writing by two extraordinarily educated, articulate, passionate lovers of literature and language. So I acquired the certain technical skills very young that were kind of surprising. I didn't play sports, I didn't do many other things, but we all wrote in our family and I knew how to write. That's not to say that I had within me the, the, the wisdom or perception or depth that can only come with age. So that's really how, where my writing has changed. If I look at my early work, it's skillful and, and um, accomplished in certain ways for a very young person, but I didn't have life behind me. Um, I will add that one thing that has changed me as a writer is readers. Um, a gift in my life over these many years has been the voices of readers speaking to me and writing to me about their lives and about my work. And what it has taught me is huge, almost boundless respect for the intelligence and perception of the reader. I think I explain less and less and less with every book because it seems to me readers get it. Readers know so much and I, I, I want to respect them for that. Once again, I, I can't wait to hear what Joyce has to say. Is this a question for me also, how my writing has evolved? Yes, of course, and maybe in terms of the conjunction between the landscape changing, but also you as a person changing and this idea of age and experience too. Well, I think I'm probably more of a formal, formalist than Joyce Maynard is. I'm very interested in the forms of fiction and experimentation. So um, I do have subjects, obviously, that I return to, and I'm very, very interested in characterization. But I'm probably most excited by the possibility of writing in different forms and doing different things with language and maybe, you know, withholding some information, a highly selective kind of prose. The novel that was just published in, in France, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars, is much more of a realistic and tra traditional novel. In the, it's, the genre is realism, like social realism and family realism. 
which is a genre that I love to I love to work in, but I do I do experiment with other genres. The, the major change in my writing over the decades has been, I don't narrate as much as I did. Now I've tried to present mediated characters and the prose is in their voices. It's like a, they, it's more as if they are channeling their own stories instead of my telling their stories, which I did when I was a young writer. You know, I, I, I was thinking, Joyce, and while I'm speaking to everybody here of them, um, a, a curious phenomenon that occurred with my most recent book, the one that has just also been published in France, Où vivaient les gens heureux, that in, it bears a, it's, it's the story of a marriage and a divorce and a family after a divorce. I guess you would call it social realism, which is kind of the territory that I generally inhabit. Um, I wrote a novel that, that, that delved into those very themes 25 years ago. Um, it was also a novel that, that focused on a, a divorced woman. Um, and only, I never reread my work. I'm guessing you don't, how could you? You have so much of it, you'd never write anything new. But somebody who, who did remember recently read that other book, it was called Where Love Goes, commented to me that there were a couple of scenes in the old book that, that showed up in the new one. I hadn't copied them. I wasn't really intentionally plagiarizing myself, but, mm. but what had changed was the perspective of the writer to those things. I, I, and this is maybe not so much um, an observation about the evolution of my writing as the evolution of my personhood, that the woman I was, and I say the woman, not just the writer, the woman I was at 35 and 45 and 55, even 55, had far less capacity for forgiveness, I think, than I do today. I, um, and I don't know any shortcut to acquiring, you know, we pay a big price for, for the sorts of wisdom that come with age, but, but I, the novel, the new novel is really a, a re-exploration of themes that have been with me for a very long time, but from the perspective of somebody who has surrendered a great deal that I used to hold on to in my youth. And yes, so it's, a very, it's a very exemplary novel, exemplary novel in that I think in writing about Eleanor and her sacrifices and her capacity for ultimately for forgiveness, her magnanimity of spirit, basically you're really writing about subjects that are very uh, resonate very strongly with many other women. I, as, it, as it happens, the main character in my novel is also a mother and she has, she has five children and she loves them all and she sort of has effaced herself and she, um, she's sort of from the same mold, you know, the, the really, yeah. really genuinely loving mother who is very happy when she's caring for people. And I had to smile at, at the end of Joyce's novel because she says her ex-husband who's treated her so badly and we're just so, the reader is so exasperated with him. But this is exactly what would happen. Eleanor says, well, he's got cancer and he's not gonna live probably too much longer. I could take care of you. And I thought, of course. <laughs> well, your your woman does this too, Joyce. And the same thing. I, I was my thinking... novel. The, there's a man she she she's in love with, and he's probably in remission from cancer. I mean, it's not exactly spelled out, but you get that impression. And she's going to end up caring for him. <laughs> and the two <laughs> novels end the same way. They take such a different route, you know, yes. to get to that that Fear same thing. So we're very well paired. I, you know, I was speaking to with a group of readers of, of the new book last night, American readers, and, and several of them said how angry they felt about the, the choices that this woman had made. And, <laughs> and some of them just wanted to smash the book down. I said, did you stop reading? No, they did not. So that was good news. But I, and they said, why did she have to do that? Her life would have gone so much better if she hadn't, to which I said, of course, would there have been a novel? It is... It is, I think, our job as storytellers, and as you say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a more traditional one by far than, than, than you, Joyce, <laughs> to not to hold up a picture of 
characters leading exemplary lives and making the best choices, but to shine a light on the things human beings do. And, and I, I hope that in, in shining that light, perhaps we, we call some of those actions into question. Well, then one, one of the elements in your writing, Joyce, that I particularly notice in the new novel is how you have your characters change over time. Eleanor starts out, she's about 20 years old when we first meet her going to buy our farmhouse and she's so naive and youthful and idealistic. And she's always going to be that same person, but then she's, she matures and she sees her children. She thought would always love her. Of course, why would she not think that? But for a while, there's an interim where they don't, they don't seem to love her. Totally believable. And a lot of characters who are secondary characters in your novel, Joyce, deliver a lot of wisdom and the way our friends do. Yes. You know, they tell us things that the reader, sort of tell the reader and these secondary characters are on the same wavelength. But Eleanor, she's not listening or she doesn't get it, but we're, we, we sort of get it. And the way that you get to your ending is really masterful and brilliant because while I was not surprised at the ending, I just had to smile. Uh, at the same time, I probably couldn't have, could not have predicted it. Well, neither could I. I would say I've got a question for you actually about this because, you know, I I frequently get asked how much I plan out a novel and. Um, and I certainly, there are many writers that I deeply respect who will say, yes, they know everything that's going to happen. I think John Irving says he writes the last sentence, but I, I do not make a plan. And in fact, even 20 pages from the end of this one, this is, this is often the case. I had no idea how I was going to locate where I was, where these characters were going to land. Um, they led me to it. I, I knew, I knew it couldn't be happily ever after, but I wanted to offer some kind of redemption. But I'm so curious to know what you say to that one. For well, yourself, just to, your work. To, to remain for a moment on your novel, you do have the ending and the beginning. I mean, there's this loud crash of the thunder, the lightning. I have the I have the ending, the setting of the ending, but I really didn't know. You didn't know that they'd be get together? I didn't know that. No, I did not. And of well, course, you know, you're such you're so soft hearted <laughs> that if a um, <laughs> <laughs> if, a, if a dog limped in the scene, you know, and needed help, you, you were just going to go and run and well, help. Have off. you ever killed a cat in one of your novels, Joyce? Something tells me you don't. Killed a... A cat. Have you ever killed off a cat in a novel? No. No, I wouldn't <laughs> think so. Um, no, I don't think so. Not at all. But about... Um, was there a question addressed to me because we've been talking I about... Yes, I wanted to... Uh, I, because um, I, I wanted to know you whether you know oh, plan right right of course plan ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do. I usually know the endings of my novels. I don't know every chapter, but I spend a lot of time walking and running. I like to run, and I I, I imagine the novels as like as movies in my mind. So it I takes do. I do exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I do know the endings, and I don't really feel comfortable about starting if I don't know my destination. It's interesting, your character goes full circle. She has her home, the farm, which is a pastoral, idyllic, sort of like an American dream kind of New England farm. She loses it, she's in exile, and she comes full circle and comes back to it. You see, you could say that she is going to help her husband, but on a deeper level. She's, she's actually coming back to the farm. Yeah. And so that's very clever because the husband is almost, he's collateral. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen how the husbands come and go. I mean, yes. other people come and go, but the land is there. Yes, and I didn't Scarlett O'Hara say that. But in my novel, I knew that my character, Jessalyn, who's a widow, she sort of has to go out into the world. She goes to the, she ends up in, at the end of the novel, she's in the Galapagos, where my husband, Charlie, and I went. And she's so far away from home now, all these needy adult children who are always sort of pulling at her. And there are still like, they're still like young children in their 
jealousy of one another. She's far away from them and she's gotten married again and she's in the Galapagos and that's the end of the novel. Right, well, I haven't really finished up with these characters. I'm actually down here in Guatemala writing a sequel. So um, don't give up on Eleanor's ability to um, finally um, release herself from obligations to her children. She, she may yet do this. I, in fact, this much I know she will. Well, that's what you intend, but you don't know by the time you get to the end of the novel, you don't know what's going to happen, which is so wonderful. That's the way it should be. Um, it is what, what ensures that I will leap out of bed at five in the morning to get to work, that, that curiosity for myself. <laughs> At least you actually killed some people in a novel so they can't come back. <laughs> I, did. I, I I have some rules about children there, but um, yes, some. some. <laughs> it's greater that you bring up each of your novels because it's true that both of the female protagonists, there's a lot in common with them. Um, and particularly uh, in Joyce Carol Oates in your book, uh, Night Sleep, Death Stars, she's uh, she's a uh, lost her husband she's a widow and she's lost herself kind of and Joyce Maynard with your book um Camp the Ways Eleanor sort of loses herself kind of in her life as a mother and I think the issues that you deal with with these women in your books um these are issues that have been written about and talked about for decades related to women and I find it interesting that we're talking about this in sort of a context of you know contemporary fiction too and post covid these have been books that have been published during a time when the world has changed and yet we're still having the points of discussion when it comes to women's lives and struggles it hasn't changed that much um and i wonder if you could talk about that a little bit well we saw what happened when children could no longer go to school could didn't we and who it was who generally stepped up to 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 educate them. Um, you know, I, I belong to the generation of women who, uh, in the United States at least, were viewed as the second wave feminists. I, I don't know an intelligent woman who wouldn't call herself a feminist. And I, I was, on the one hand, the beneficiary of so many um, advances in the lives of women I, uh, that were not <clears throat> possible for my mother, who suffered greatly as a, as a wife and mother of the 40s and 50s. Um, I was able to attend a previously all-male institution. Doors were flung open. You know, it seemed, it seemed that there were so many opportunities available to my generation of women. But actually, we were not released from the old ones often. It was just a new set added on. So I, I know at least I'll speak, I tend to be increasingly reluctant to speak of a whole generation or a whole group, I'll speak of myself. I, I felt a huge obligation to have the career and make the work that my mother could have made and deserved to have and, and did not, was not able to have. But at the same time, I was very locked into a set of traditional um, images that I would have children, I never really even questioned that, that I would make a home, that I would be a maker of meals. And my work has tended to celebrate that aspect of women's lives too. I'd like to, I'd like to believe that we can be both, but I very often the men who were our contemporaries were not supporting both of those things. And Joyce Carol Oates, I mean, uh, you must have something to add to this. I think your work has been so influential and uh, you have incredible female characters in your books and I, it'd be interesting to hear what you think. Well, when I first began writing, I didn't necessarily focus on women. I probably have as many male protagonists in my short stories. And I've always been sort of equally interested in men and women in a, in a kind of dramatic way. I, I probably have a little more interest in the drama of existence, the significance of our lives as, as they unfold. And I was sort of fascinated by contingency and accident. Now, Joyce Maynard was brought up in a household of books, and they were high achieving parents who either explicitly or implicitly were really pushing you to excel. 
Whereas I come from a, a background where there are virtually no books at all. Nobody went beyond the eighth grade. I was the first person to graduate from high school in my entire family, you know, both sides of the family. Going to university was totally like science fiction for anyone from my background. So my, my sense of life is it's much more capricious and adventurous. It's as if inadvertently I got in a little rowboat up in upstate New York and <laughs> I had won a war, you know, and had no idea where I was going. And, and this sort of white water rapids has been bearing that little boat along for all these decades. But nobody had planned that. My parents had no conception of really anything. They were always supportive emotionally. And they were reading my books and they, they, they enjoyed my, my novels, my, my books very much. So they didn't try to oppress me or keep me back. But I can't say that I planned my life. And people think that I'm very ambitious, but, but actually I'm just sort of excited or fascinated or hypnotized by the adventure of life. That comes across so clearly, Joyce. Uh, and me too, you know, I, I came from a, I won't say I came from high achieving parents. I came from highly frustrated parents oh. who, who had huge creative drive and, and, and talents that were never really acknowledged for, and I felt this obligation to lay something at their feet that they deserved. But then I rejected the world of the university and the academy, I guess you'd call it. And so I've been paddling in my way too. Um, uh, I didn't have a very charted course. I didn't ever have a plan. I didn't really expect to be a writer. Did you, did you, did you, did you know you were going to well, I never thought of being a writer, but I was always writing, even when I was very young. Before I could write, I was doing doodles and drawings and telling stories that way. But I'm so interested in, Joyce, uh, what you think when you look back upon your life. Do you think that accident had a lot to do with your life? I mean, if, if for instance, if, if J.D. Salinger hadn't written to you, or say you got all these letters after you wrote that piece for the magazine suppose you had not read the letter you know like you have 500 letters and you couldn't read them all how, yeah. how do you think your life might have evolved do you ever think about that oh i i for sure i have and i i used to suppose um you know for for those who don't know i was 18 years old and i got this letter from jd salinger and and it sort of derailed my life for a time i i left university. I went to live with him. I imagined as only an 18 year old can that I would be with him forever. Never really did the math that he was 53 at the time. And I was cast aside, you know, a year later. I used to think that I'd have had this whole other life of going to college and becoming, you know, a more maintaining a sort of a, a life in the mainstream in certain ways. When I went back to college, as I did many years later, I realized I'm not really a college type. And I suspect one way or another, this is not to completely release him from responsibility of having done something uh, grossly, uh, the most charitable way I can describe it is irresponsible. And I think more than that, dangerous. But the truth is I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to have adventures out in the world and I probably would not have done very well um, staying in the academic world very long. I, I may yet be a two-time Yale dropout. I'm back, but mm -hmm. only sort of back. I'm in and out. Um, well, I'm always fascinated by the way accidents and contingencies shape our lives. Yes. I mean, you're, you say that your life was derailed, and it's almost like there was a train with a, a track, you know, and you were sort of going along that track, but then li literally a de derailment that involved years. Well, I'll tell you what did change utterly was I grew up because my family, my, because my parents had not had success in their, in their artistic lives and our family didn't have money and we were living in a small town and I wanted to get to New York City and the big, uh, and I watched a lot of television. My vision of success um, when I was young and when I went off to college was very much that I would get to New York I'd become famous, I'd become known, I'd be on TV. I didn't really think about being a writer. I thought maybe I'd be a, 
a reporter, an anchor person, an actress, something. Um, and for all of the damage, and I, I, will, I will use that word that I experienced during that, that year and for many years after because of it, um, I never again was able to buy into the dream of success and fame and the definitions, the old definition that I held for myself of what, what would constitute it. So I, I really lived very much, uh, I never really, I lived only briefly in the city. I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't really sort of, um, you know, have the big time career in my youth that, it, that might have been suggested by my early success. I, I went back to New Hampshire and had babies. That was kind of crazy. I, I, I had been hired when I was 21 um, after I'd left college and after Salinger had sent me away, I had a job at the New York Times and I was kind of a young star, rising star there very briefly. And I worked very hard. I was, I was I, kind of the way you describe, I was just so curious. I just wanted to, to I, I, if I could have worked 20 hours a day as a reporter, I would have. There was so much to see and, and write about in that city. And then I fell in love and I went into the office of Abe Rosen at the office of the Abe Rosenthal, the managing editor of the New York Times and announced that I was leaving. Why? Because I wanted to get married and have a baby. This was 1977. Can you imagine a more shocking thing to say for a young woman with, you know, with a, a big career seemingly ahead of her than I want to get married, go back to a farm in New Hampshire and have babies. Um, and that, that continued to be the most elusive goal for me, and it's the goal of Eleanor, the character in my novel, was to be part of a happy family. Family was, was core for me because unlike you, I did not have some of the, the stable things that, that I think you did possess from, from what I yeah. gathered. What's well, very interesting, I think the idea of establishing a family, a, love, a loving family is absolutely, so normal and natural that um, of course one would do that. I mean, how happy would one be with a Pulitzer Prize when we're all alone, you know? When you were at the New York Times, did you know my friend Lucinda Franks? Oh yes, I did, I did. I you mean, know, she Lucinda passed star. away. Uh, did yes. you know she passed away about a year ago? Yeah, but her, her, she was a little like you. She was one of these really prodigious rising stars and she did have a Pulitzer Prize when she was very young and then she didn't stop writing but she she got married she she married Bob Bob Morgenthal the district attorney of of Manhattan but obviously the same sort of feelings that you had she wanted the family but she also wanted to write one thing that changed for me over the years was my definition of family mm -hmm. uh, I, it, mine was a rather narrow definition. I thought it had to be, you know, a man and a woman and children. And I will say even man and woman, you know, we didn't, these were days so different from now when really, you know, considerations of alternative gender choices, sexual choices of sexuality were, were not openly discussed or written about in the mainstream at least. Um, I watched a lot of television. I had these pictures imprinted on my mind. And when my own marriage ended, I felt this enormous sense of failure. I no longer, my family is broken. I no longer believe that a family, a divorced family is a broken family, that Lucinda Franks and Bob Morgenthau marrying late in life are not a family, that you and Charlie were not a family or that uh, two men, two women, a woman and a child, they're, and these are some of the things that I wanted to explore, that I want to explore in my in my work, that that have certainly my my picture of what all the different ways that that love can express itself have greatly altered. As we reach uh, the halfway mark, I just want to remind everyone watching that they can submit questions, and we'll have fifteen minutes at the end to answer questions from the audience. Um, Joyce Maynard, well, I'd like to get to at home in the world um, in a few minutes, but first of all, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, just to go back to this sort of idea of changing landscapes, something we spoke about 
before doing this call that you mentioned and Joyce Maynard also mentioned that you'd like to talk about is the changing political world. And it's interesting in terms of your book, Joyce Carolotes, uh, Night Sleep, Deaf Stars, because it opens with an act of police brutality, which is very, you know, prescient right now. It's it's in the news every day. It's been going on for forever, but people are only talking about it really in the past few years. And I'm wondering, could you talk about why you chose to open your book with this scene and perhaps discuss the significance it has in relation to your work in the changing political landscape and how you uh, how you write your work in light of this, these kinds of topics? Well, all, all of my novels are set in a certain society, a certain social moment. I'm interested in the context where the, the family, the personal life, the family life, within a, a city and a community and a, a nation, let's say a kind of consciousness, a sense of morality of how people are living so that the family is like a microcosm. I almost never write a novel that's only about a family or, or you know, about the characters who are the cast of characters. The novels that I write are all, always, always have this larger um, I wouldn't say it's mythic, but I'm sort of trying for something beyond just the personal. So I have written about police brutality, but basically it's writing about white entitlement and white, white blindness to the injustices of society. I have a whole sequence of novels that are modernist gothics that are set like in the 19th century, sort of looking at the evolution of our society and, and the, the white ruling class and the, the, the real failures to, to be responsible and to acknowledge so, social injustice. So naturally, this white man, he's, a, he's not an unsympathetic, but he, he feels entitled. So he can sort of stop his car and tell these police officers to stop beating up this dark-skinned man he, he, who is not actually a black, she's not African-American, but he's, he's Indian-American. So the, I wanted to show how the, the sense of white privilege and white entitlement is just very, very delusional. When you have social injustice for anybody in a society, it will metastasize out like evil to, to everybody. So he's not He's not immune. So the whole the whole novel with him is precip precipitated by the patriarch making this mistake, and then the the tragedy is precipitated. Like every chapter that follows from there is a consequence of the of the the prologue. A, a, a fascinating element we should say is that this novel um, that's just come out in France came out just before the George George Floyd. Uh, events, the events surrounding George. So you imagined um, a situation and a, and a set of pressures, Joyce, before they had, I mean, of course they were playing out all over our country in lots of ways, but they hadn't reached that pressure cooker, but, but you foresaw that story. Well, th these things have been happening all, of course, you know, for decades. I mean, going back, for, going back literally forever. I mean, we don't have lynchings anymore, but we did have lynchings up until like the 1960s. So because, because people have such short memories, I think both George Floyd <laughs> would precipitate a novel like this. Actually, there were many other George Floyds who lived and died very, un they were killed very unjustly, but they were not on social media. It just happened accidentally that a young woman had recorded the, the murder of George Floyd on her cell phone. That's why he's so, so well known. But how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have died anonymously in the same sort of way, but nobody was recording it. And, and Joyce, her character being white felt able to do what the, the black characters in surrounding that scene were, did not feel uh, safe in, in doing. He stepped in, imagining his immunity. And, and Joyce Maynard, I mean, uh, 
do you also feel it's important to be aware of the changing political world in your fiction? I can't um, separate the two. I can't, yeah. you know, we, we live our lives um, both in, you know, the, 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 the small world of the family and the family existing in, um, you know, in our country, in our politics, in our the streets of our cities, in our environment. Um, my my novel, because it takes place over forty years, follows a lot of uh, things that were sort of cultural moments of the time. Uh, the novel pretty much opens with, or at least after the after the contemporary scene opens, the the Watergate hearings are going on, and and the draft is an issue. And over the course of the novel, um, I. There's always a sort of a background. It's as if the television is always on and you're hearing not necessarily the most ultimately politically significant events, but the 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 murmur of the culture or the or the scream of the culture. Um, Eleanor's marriage sort of blows apart on the day that the that the challenger explodes. Um, and and I did, I chose that event very deliberately. Her her daughter is obsessed with this with this space launch and it symbolizes for her hope and dreams and conquest and instead of course everything goes wrong and she comes back home and everything has gone wrong at home as well Joyce excuse me I went, when I read that I thought it seems so authentic and so vivid I was wondering if something of that experience was your own the the challenge oh, sure. I mean I'm 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 all through all my books, sometimes in disguise. But um, I lived in New Hampshire when the Challenger exploded, and so Krista McAuliffe, the you know the teacher in space, who had been sort of presented to us as the one to get attached to, very deliberately to support the space program, she came from 30 miles away. I had met her, uh, I interviewed her, yeah. and I had a daughter the age of my character Ursula. Not not one as obsessed with that launch as mm -hmm. Ursula is, but it, it just the the metaphor struck me as too rich to ignore. Um, uh, and another sort of significant turning point within the last two years that, and it's another thing we spoke about before today's call, is Me Too. And Joyce Carol Oates, I remember you mentioning that when we were talking about At Home in the World, um, Joyce Maynard's book, a uh, memoir about her times in her early 20s, and it mentions your relationship with J.D. Salinger, but a lot of other stuff too, about your life and your writing and your family. And Joyce Carol Oates, you said that you feel like if this book came out today, it would have had a very different reception to the way it did when it came out back in uh, the 90s, I think it was 1998 that it was published. Um, absolutely yeah. absolutely the me, me too movement has sort of opened the doors it began i think as young women and girls who didn't have any voice at all who were not famous i mean later on it, it sort of gravitated toward very famous hollywood actresses and so forth but i think it really began as like a grassroots movement of extreme frustration and it's just so healthy and and good, especially in the beginning, where it's sort of opening these, these doors. But it's just outrageous that Joyce Maynard is somehow not allowed to write about her own life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just- It's, you know, for, for, people, for people listening to this today, Joyce, it, young people, people who were born after this time, after the year 2000 in particular, it's, it's I, I want to give a little historical perspective that when in 1998, I published a memoir in which I told the story. And I will say it was much more than a mention. It was probably, you know, 200 pages of that book were devoted to this early, uh, this rather disastrous relationship with this important man, this great writer. When I, and I, I kept my silence about that relationship for, for a full 25 years, subscribing myself to the belief that he was so much more important than I, then here comes that, caretaking of women again. It was my my responsibility to protect him from the truth of his own actions. When I finally released myself from that responsibility at the age of 42, 25 years later, and wrote this memoir, I was almost universally condemned. I was referred to in the pages of the New York Times as a predator for telling this story. And, and one of the very few 
literary voices that spoke up on my behalf was Joyce Carol Oates. Very eminent people um, dismissed the book, dismissed me, some of them saying, I, I would never even read this book. So they never even knew what the story was. Um, I didn't know Joyce Carol Oates at the time, but it was a, a very lonely time. And when Joyce published a piece in which she addressed this phenomenon, it was, you know, this like a hat on my shoulder. Well, I'm really happy to hear that, but it is outrageous. Yes. And so many women, so many women were throwing stones too. And it's very much lit, almost literally like throwing stones. It's like, yes, oh, yes. this person has violated some taboo. Yes. You can't talk about a man. I mean, well, excuse me. I we wish are, I could we're say. gonna talk, we're going we are going to talk about. But I, I, I wish I could say, Joyce, that this was totally in the past, but it is not. I think it, it, it doesn't entirely go backwards. If this book were published now, it would have a different response. I'm speaking of at home in the world. I, when I published Count the Ways, a man came to interview me who spent fully the first half hour asking me questions about Salinger. And I had to flick them away again and again and say, I've done many things in my life since I slept with a famous man 50 years ago. Um, it still happens to this day. And because of that, you know, there are people who will say, she's still talking about that. I still talk about it because they still do that. Well, it's an interesting sort of almost metaphysical uh, dilemma. If you had your whole life to live over again, would you answer that letter? You know, like we feel that our lives are very often crossroads. I have made some decisions in my life that might've gone the other way. They turned out to be good, but mm -hmm. I pretty much was debating, you know, I might've gone in a different direction. It might've been disastrous or it might've been good. Whereas you actually were, you were almost literally at a turning point in your life, you know, like Robert Frost said, two roads diverse in, in a yellow wood. I mean, you, you made a decision and if you look back upon your life, if you had gone in a different direction, you wouldn't have all this attention and, and this wouldn't be this punitive sense, you know, that this person, has, this upstart has violated a taboo. On the other hand, it has made you the writer you are and you can look up, upon it as like fate, you know, it makes you the person you are maybe more sensitive or more aware of injustice than you might've been otherwise. Um. I think I, I, I do reject the idea that Salinger's presence in my life made me a writer. And you know, some of the people who will most, you know, witheringly dismiss me say, you know, I just attached my cart to his wagon. Not but at it, all. You were already a writer. But it did, you're correct that it it made me an outsider. I would never again be a part of any any institution system. I was an other. And I think that 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 is often uh, the place where a writer resides. Yeah, and if I can just pr um, provide an interesting little parenthetical remark, Norman Mailer had enormous success with his first novel. He's only about 25 years old. He, he got universal acclaim. So that only about two years later when he published his second novel, all the same reviewers and critics were waiting and they all pounced on him. And I think literally every review he got for the, the Deer Park or whatever the second novel was, was all negative. And so he said he was knocked down. He had been told he was the greatest writer, you know, since Tolstoy, and now he was told he couldn't write at all. He said, you know, I got up and I thought from now on, I'm totally on the outside. Yes. I'm going to be like a, a rebel or a renegade or a rogue, you know, I'm totally... I've, I've been knocked completely out and I struggled back up to my feet. So it might just be that that kind of experience, though it's awful and traumatic and we wouldn't really want to go through it, but maybe that is something that makes us sharper and more perceptive, but also you're more sympathetic and sensitive. To, this I believe you know, that you, I, I, I feel when you have gone through a fire, it takes a great deal to burn you again. Right. Right. Joyce Carlos, I'm interested, do you feel like an outsider as a writer? Or... Well, um, my, my life is, is quite different. I think I did, live, I did lead a life 
uh, externally very conventional and traditional. Mm -hmm. As soon as I became a professor, I started teaching when I was quite young, about 22 years old. And I became like an associate professor and a full professor. I suddenly had this institutional identity and I had been at Princeton, I'm actually still at Princeton for decades. So uh, John Updike once told me, you know, that what the New Yorker was for him, Princeton University was for me, it's like this enormous historic institution where I have been in the community. So I don't have in a sense a life on the outside I feel sometimes psychologically or emotionally that I'm kind of on the outside, but I think that's existential, ontological unease that we feel sometimes in our own skin is pretty universal. Totally. Um, I see we have questions, so I'm going to move to the last question I have for you both, and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, so you're both extremely accomplished and remarkably talented writers, and so I feel like it would be a shame to not ask you both tonight if maybe if there are aspiring writers watching this, which I think there are, I think you have a lot of fans who are also writers and a lot of readers who are also writers. Um, perhaps what would be the advice you would give someone today uh, who wanted to write and maybe particularly as a woman too, what a woman writer, what you think they should hear? Go to the dangerous place, go to the unsafe place. Um, go to the, uh, this is I think especially true for women, um, although I'm not affiliated with, with a, um, a, an educational institution, a college, a university, I, I teach writing on occasion and I teach memoir and women, never men, but women are always worried about displeasing someone, upsetting somebody, being cast out, hurting them. I, I don't think probably somebody like Norman Mailer spent a lot of time worrying about those kinds of things. <laughs> you. Um, right. So I, I would say to that, we have so few total freedoms in our lives. This do not let anyone take away from you the freedom to tell your story, to be, to tell the truth, to tell something shocking. Um, in At Home in the World, there was a very shocking word that Salinger uttered to me when I was 18 years old um, in a, a very painful context. My editor at the time, 25 years later, said, you cannot put that word in a book. It's too shocking. I won't say that word here, but, but you might guess. Um, I did put it in that book. I, be brave, uh, be brave and be fearless. And it's the one place, the one place maybe where you can um, be utterly true to yourself. Yes, I think that's very good advice. And if, if you don't feel that you can be so completely open and explicit, you can always write under a pseudonym. Yes. And, and I think the idea of writing under a pseudonym is very appealing. You don't have to necessarily have a sexual or gender identity. You just could be initials. Okay. And I'm kind of drawn to that. Uh, my own background is more like, as I said, I'm, I'm a formalist. I'm really very interested in the forms of fiction. So the most, um, the best advice that I could give to somebody is to look at a, a, fic, a, a fiction writer or a poet whom you really revere. For me, it was the young Ernest Hemingway. I studied his stories just by myself. I mean, they were not in English class, but when I was about 14, 15 years old, I was quite mesmerized by the young Ernest Hemingway and his early stories set in, in Northern Michigan. So that was kind of the, the template for a way of writing a story or writing even a chapter. And then later on, I discovered William Faulkner, whose command of sentences is, is totally antithetical to Hemingway's. And I was kind of fascinated by these two ways of being in the world, of what the consciousness that evolves from the Hemingway um, vision and from Faulkner. Faulkner is all about history and the past intruding into the present. And Hemingway is mostly about dealing right now with this existential present. So I was quite mesmerized by that. So I would say for young writers or poets to find somebody whose work is really great and, and all encompassing like work of genius and really immerse yourself in it and see what you can learn from it. 
That reminds me of um, Zadie Smith said that when she was, you know, practicing her writing style, she just wrote out passages from Agatha Christie novels because she loved her. And yeah. That's funny because Zadie Smith is a much better writer than me. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. thing. <laughs> it's so weird. She's a much better writer. I don't think Agatha Christie is very interesting at all compared to Zadie Smith. Yeah, totally. Um, so we have a lot of uh, questions and there's still time for people to submit while you're answering these ones. Um, so Susan Solomon has a question for you, Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, she says, or they say, you move easily between genres from literary to gothic, crime and horror fiction. Is this mainly a formal experiment for you or do you feel using uh, different genres can be more effective for telling certain stories? Well, obviously, this, the, the novel of social realism has the potential to reach the largest audience. That's the most readily accessible of the forms of fiction. But I'm drawn to the Gothic also and uh, the surreal because they mimic our dreams. So for me, it's basically maybe alter one alternates with the other. If I write a, a novel that's strictly realistic, I might be drawn in with the next novel to something more surreal. Um, and then next question, this is from Rosemary Rung, and they ask, uh, what is the greatest influence to the growth you experience as a writer? So I guess, uh, what influences your growth and experience in writing? And there's a lot there, I think. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it is life in the world. It is life in the world. And this is antithetical to the, the concept that some writers um, design for themselves of, of, of um, sequestering themselves from the world. I can't, um, on the one hand, being in the world makes it much harder for me to get my work done. On the other hand, it, 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 it gives me the stuff of my work. Um, I'm right now, I'm here writing a book, but I'm also working in a Mayan indigenous community, uh, building um, a structure on my property and I'm, and I'm working in a garden and I'm, I'm repairing a, a wall. And they're all, uh, I, I, right at the moment, I'm living in another culture, but back, back in California where, where I was living um, last week, uh, um, there was a rampage of wild boars in my yard, that yard where you sat, Joyce. Really? Yes, wild they, boars. they ate up my whole yard looking for grubs. I, oh. I, somewhere along the line, a wild boar is going to wander into a novel of mine. They, I've seen film footage of them. They only come at night. They're terrifying animals. And they're wow. huge and dangerous. So I have to be in the world. I guess the world keeps on sending me stories. <laughs> Well, I think one thing that we have in common, apart from our names, is that we've learned to, to compartmentalize our lives. You have the writing life, where you have to be sort of merciless and pitiless about your own self. You just have to keep working, even sometimes when you don't feel that happy, you, you keep working. And then the rest of your life can be creative, you're making dinners, you're building a house, you're dealing with your animals and the wild boars are stamping through your backyard and you're giving dinner parties and you're teaching, you know, it's, it's like an oscillation between the social external world, which, which we do love and which we, which gives us nourishment. And then the solitary, very intense world where we are literally all alone. I, you know, I was thinking about the two of us being together, of course, the last few days, and I thought one, one thing we share, one thing we have in common is that we keep writing. There are writers who have stopped and who say, and I don't criticize them for this. They, they've said what they wanted to say and they're, they're done. I, I don't think, I think the only story I will not tell is the story of my death. I, I will, and I, when I consider my life, I'm about to turn 68. I realize that this is the thing I have done more than anything else in my life besides breathing. I longer than I was my parents' child, longer than I was the wife of my first husband or my very good second husband who died, longer than I have been the parent of my children and taking care of them. It is my work that sustains me. And I, you know, you and I, Joyce, in recent years have both lived through the loss of a beloved partner. 
it is work that sustains me. The night, this may be a horrifying thing for some people to hear, but the night that my husband Jim died and I, he had been dying for some time, I first lay in the bed for about an hour next to him. I, I had awakened and realized he had died. And then I went downstairs in the middle of the night and I opened my laptop and I began to write. That is what I do. And that is what has nourished me and sustained me more than anything else. That's very interesting. Yes, yeah, so you have, you have a real balance. And of course you're a mother and you're, you're, you always be a mother, you know? So that's another identity that you took on when you were in your 20s and that, you know, basically will stay with you. We have to give up our identities as daughters at some point and maybe as wives. But these other identities are sort of linger in our memory. And I think as people get older, they do think back upon their earlier lives and try to figure out like, how did it happen that I wound up here? And I have to say, just for Joyce Maynard's information, I'm literally in the room that Jessalyn spent time in. This is the bed. I'm, the house that is in my novel, Night Sleep, Death in the Stars, is the house I'm living in. I was guessing. I was yeah. guessing. Yeah. yeah. And this is it. And, uh, and, and the farm in Count the Ways is the farm where I was married and where I gave birth to my children. I felt no need to fictionalize it. Absolutely. Because we love that. We love yeah. to commemorate and memorialize. Well, we didn't talk too much about this, but one of the functions of art is to memorialize the past. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I, there are many aspects of my life in this novel. It is a work of fiction, but many people have asked me, what, what do my children feel? I have three adult children. What do they feel about this book? There's not a one of them who has read it yet. I think one is starting to, but it's, it's an uncomfortable, it's a complicated experience. I understand that. They are, do your children read your, I, read your books? Uh, they, only my youngest son, only my youngest son. My daughter actually always asks me to tell her the story. And I, it's okay, I have readers. I, I don't need my children to be readers, but I gave them each a copy of this new book because more than any other, it speaks to their experience in certain ways. And well, you're, you're very, very uh, almost pitiless about Eleanor herself. You know, the reader can see her probably making mistakes. They're good hearted. She makes mistakes of magnanimity and naivete. And pays, pays dearly for them. And, and I, I knew she pays, I, and she pays I, I for them. And we sort of see this working out almost in real time. You know, she does something on one page, and you think, "Oh no, don't do that." <laughs> she, gives away, she gives away her farm. I have to say, at that point, I said, "Please, you know, you're not a martyr. Don't give away your farm." But then she'll get the farm back at the end. So it's all kind of coming back. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I'm sorry that we're not going to get to every question. I feel like this conversation could go on and on because it's so fascinating. Um, but this is an interesting one from Irene Gammon. And they ask, how has the forced isolation of the pandemic affected your writing? Not so much the subject matter of your work, but more the process, the inspiration, your level of productivity. And they say that they're asking as someone who hasn't been an active writer in 30 years, but with more solo time, they're inclined to start writing again. Has it affected you, the, the change in schedule? Um, Joyce, you want to go first? Well, I was, I was teaching. I'm a professor. I was teaching at, at Princeton University and also at Rutgers. I had one class each. So the major change in my life was that I went to Zoom rather than teaching in person. So that was a very big uh, you know, implementing a whole new medium, which was exciting and turned out to be good. And the writing, of course, I'm always alone when I'm writing anyway. And so the pandemic for me was, as I said, mainly this wrenching where I spent much more time in the house alone. I met friends outside and we went for walks in, in the cold and we had some sort of you know, social life, mostly just walking, going for walks together. I wouldn't say that my life was changed profoundly, however, because I am a widow. I do live alone, so I was still living alone. For me, and I, I have to resist being almost guilty and apologetic about this, because I know how much pain so many people endured. 
for me, the pandemic was an extraordinarily fruitful, creatively rich time. I was here. I had come down to this lake, to this volcano, I thought for one week to teach a memoir workshop and that the, the, the pandemic was certainly starting, but there was no reported COVID in Guatemala. And I came to be here for whatever students would appear and a surprising number of them still did come. But during the course of that week, plane flights were canceled, the airport was closed. The US Embassy did send a plane to bring my students home, not just my students, any Americans here, but I, I chose to stay, I knew in my, I've made lots of bad choices in my life, but this was a, an excellent one. I knew I'd be better off here. And I invited two of my young writing students, both young women of age 32, to stay with me. I figured it would be for a month. It was for six months. And every day we each worked in solitude on our projects. There weren't even these boats that you see here, weren't even traveling across the lake. I, I, I rewrote Count the Ways, uh, the, the novel that's just come out in France. Um, while I was here, wrote another whole novel. Every night I would come down, we'd share dinner together out here on this deck and look out at the volcano and the stars. And I would read out loud to the girls. I called them the girls. They, I was very much writing with them in mind, my young readers. And I was almost sad to leave it. I was sad to leave it. I had to go back to the world, but it was this glorious moment out of time when I, the world stopped and I could invite these characters in and live with them in, a, in the most uninterrupted way. Um, I miss it. There's, so to finish this talk, I think this is a nice way to finish uh, after what we've discussed today. There's quite a few questions about that are focusing on uh, you writing as a woman, but also uh, specifically for Joyce Maynard, some, uh, Elizabeth Swinney, they ask, how were you able, quote, to put one foot in front of the other after being dismissed so much after your book came out in the 90s? And then uh, Pamela Martineau references your book, Joyce Carol Oates' Foxfire Confessions of a Girl Game, which they say was so radical, especially pre Me Too. And I think there's a connection between a lot of these questions in this chat box, and it's sort of uh, how is women writing about your personal experiences? And then that's very vulnerable position because you're using stuff from your personal life brief as well as you were just talking about and then putting it out into the world. And I'm wondering if it's cathartic for you or uh, how do you feel? Well, for sure it's cathartic, but nobody should have to pay $25 for my personal catharsis. So it had better be something more. I, you know, I started out life as a pleaser, a good girl. I wanted to make my parents happy. I sent my stories off to Seventeen magazine, even before that to Humpty Dumpty magazine, to make my parents happy. And I was, I, I, I dedicated my first memoir when I was 18, written when I was 18 years old, to my parents, never mentioned that my father was an alcoholic because that would have upset them, you know? When I, and gradually I became a more honest writer, but only when I published At Home in the World, the, the book that seemed to please nobody, the book that was almost universally condemned in the, the press and the literary world, did it become plain. I was no longer going to please. And I would either feel like a failure for my inability to please, or I would question the concept of being such a good girl. I haven't been a good girl since. And I think it's one reason why I feel compelled to teach women memoir, that I, I, I want to pass on, nobody should have to be given permission, but if they need it, I will grant it, to, to not be such a good girl, to tell the hard stories. And I'm, I'm freed, I have to say, I feel like Lady Godiva, you know, I, I, I remember still a moment at a very big literary festival that I was only invited to because there was one writer friend who, who, who was my advocate. But I, as I took the stage, one entire row of very eminent literary figures got up en masse and walked out of the room. Am I to then feel that I'm a terrible person because they did that? Or am I to question the standards that I have bought into that I need their approval. Um, 
So well, you're a wonderful model. I'm thinking of the very ending of The Stranger by, by Camus, where Marisol is being taken out to, he's going to be uh, beheaded, I think it's a guillotine. He's going to be executed. And he says, all I need now is to hear the, the angry cries of the crowd to really <laughs> feel good. You know, like, <laughs> you're going to execute me and scream at me. And, you know, like, I always think of that ending of Camus' novel. And oh. so in your novel, Joyce, you say several times, Eleanor would never have thought she could live through some of these things and survive them. But in fact, you not only survive them, but then you sort of think back to them and wonder, like, what was the fuss about? It wasn't even that important. Yeah, yes, exactly. I think uh, that's all we have time for tonight. So thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Joyce. It was an honor to have you. Such, such an honor, yes. such a pleasure. Thank you. Lots of fun. Thank, yes. thank you all. And pass it on to Severine to close. Voila, on behalf of the Columbia Global Centers, Paris, the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, and the American Library in Paris, I would like to thank the two of you, Joyce Carol Oates and Joyce Maynard, for drawing us into the intimacy of your friendship in this conversation that has touched upon so many topics from artistic freedom, uh, women's writing, the power of grassroots movements, Me Too, the diversity of authorial voices today, the wisdom gained with age and learning to let go. But most of all, thank you for inviting us to lead a life full of adventures, I quote you, being brave, fearless, of the, uh, unafraid of displeasing. And even for those of us who are not writers, I think we can adapt, adopt your philosophy of not having anyone take away from our freedom of telling our stories. So thank you again. And thank you as well to our international audience for engaging with us in this conversation. We hope to see merci. you. Enchanté. <laughs> <laughs> Parfait. We hope to see you in our next event in the Entre Nous series, which will take place on November 15th, and the subject of that conversation will be on art and political activism. Merci beaucoup. Bye. Bye. <laughs>